Good morning. You're welcome to join us with a gathering song or continue visiting with your friends. Shepherd, lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pasture, feed us, for our use thy comforts bear. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast drawn us that we are. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus, Thou hast brought us mine, we are. We are Thine to help and us, be the guardian of our way. Give Thy flock who sinned in us, take us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear thy children when they pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear thy children when they pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Good morning. The attendance pads are on the street side of the sanctuary. Please pick those up, sign your name, and pass them across, and then send them back so that you can see who you were, are worshiping with. Prayer this morning will be calling out names of people, not giving other information, just names. There will be a membership class meeting this Wednesday at 11 o'clock in the uh, Pastor Ron's office, Wednesday, 11 o'clock. Those of you that are interested, please come join us. Pop-up worship is going to be Friday. Now, Friday's cruise night, and yep, we're aware of that. We're going to have pop-up worship right out here, uh, outside the main doors to the sanctuary, uh, offering prayer. Um, Pastor Ron and the team will be there. Join them at 5.30. Friday at 5.30. In your bulletin, you'll find the financial picture as of August 31st. You may wonder why it always is so far behind, but we don't have the receipts in from September yet, um, so we can't tell you where we are. We don't, the bills aren't all paid, the, the income today will have income coming in, so that's why it runs a month behind. The newsletter is available today. Those of you who get it electronically have already received it. If uh, you go over to coffee hour, you'll find yours over on the table in the fellowship hall. Pastor Bob will call us to worship. Good morning, church. We doing good? Yeah. Amen. I want to call us to worship in the spirit of Psalm 100, which is an awesome psalm. 
It says this, beginning at verse 1. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. Amen. Let's enter into worship this morning with that kind of spirit. Please stand for our opening hymn. Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. My living hope. May be seated. So often we want to hear others speak, but we forget that we should be listening to our Lord as he speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. This next song talks about that. Calm our, calm our minds, calm our lives, and listen to the voice of God speak to us.
This morning we're going to, as we go to prayer, we're going to take time just to lift up names of someone that you're concerned about or is part of your family that might be hurting. Um, Whatever it might be, instead of praying exactly what's going on, we're simply going to just pray for people. And you'll have the opportunity, just raise your hand and someone will bring you a mic. Um, Yes, John. Let's pray for the King family for their loss of now. Okay, that's good. Thank you. All right, let's go to prayer, all of us, and um, raise your hand, and we will all pray together. The Crespo family. Yes, sir. Catherine. Mm-hmm. I pray for Connie John and my friend Bill. Yes, Lord. Carol Boatner. Mm-hmm. Our friend John Beck. Yes, Lord. Paula Ball. Mm-hmm. Dion and the residents of the post acute unit. Yes, Lord. Pastor Bob. Myself. For Larry. Thank you, Lord. For Kehara. Bill Elder. Mm. Bonnie Rivera. Doris Donovan. Mm. Laura. My sons. Yes, Lord. Wayne McCoy. Church of the Park. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Second Chronicles seven fourteen, mm. and for Veronica's family. Yes, Lord. For this church to be a bright witness on Friday and Thursday night. Mm-hmm. For those wonderful children. <laughs> Lord, we lift up each of those names. May your will be done in each of them. And through you and whatever you do, may you be glorified and honored. So we lift up these folks In the powerful name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This Friday at 5.30, we'll be meeting out in the front. I envision us playing music not too loud because we don't want to be a nuisance to the band that might be 
already playing on Main Street. Uh, giving out popcorn, popping some popcorn right there. But a little soft music to create an atmosphere of prayer. And then we're going to have our two uh, We're Here to Pray for You signs. I know people are going to stop by in need of prayer. Um, of all the times we've put out prayer signs, there's only been one time where we really didn't get no takers when we went to Teague Park. But everywhere else, and even two weeks ago at Wainimi Beach, people stopped by and uh, asked for prayer. And we're able to witness and just speak about the hope that's ours in Christ. So we'll be meeting here at 530, probably be here till about 7. Um, and we'll be right in front of our building as people are walking by to see we're here to pray for you. Uh, so I encourage you not to be an scaredy cat, but to let the Holy Spirit make you bold, baptize you with fire. And remember those words. Jesus said, if you declare me before peeps, I will declare you before my pops. So uh, let's be a witness and let's pray for people. Amen. Today, I want to speak to you about believing and receiving the mission of Jesus, our Messiah. His hometown rejected his mission, which is just flabbergasting. And the passage is Luke chapter 4, 16 to 30. But instead of reading it to you, to be sure, I will read it as I uh, unpack it. But we're going to actually see it, act it out for us, and then after... Most of the verses I'll cover as we rehearse them and think about what they might be saying to us. So let's go ahead and watch this clip. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, to the opening of the prison for those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, The fulfillment of this scripture, as you have heard it, is today. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Not bad for a carpenter's son, yes? <laughs> I mean, especially Joseph. And he said to them, No doubt one of you will quote me the proverb, Physician, heal yourself. The things we heard you did in Capernaum and in Syria, do here in your hometown. And he said, But this brings up an important truth. No prophet is acceptable in his hometown when a great famine hit Israel. During the days of Elijah, three years and six months, there were many widows, but Elijah was sent to none of them. Instead, he was sent to a widow in Sidon, in Zarephath a Gentile woman. What about Elisha and Naaman? There were many lepers in Israel during this time. None of them were cleansed except Naaman. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So, who's ready to receive and believe the mission of the Messiah? Mashiach. What is, what does that mean? Mashiach. It's the anointed king that all the prophets had spoken about for eons and years and hundreds of years. The promised Messiah that would come to fulfill this mission statement that Isaiah promises hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ was born, that a king would come 
God's anointed king. Anointed, meaning smeared or covered with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. And he had the Spirit of God to be God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh. 100% human being, 100% God. And he was God's anointed, empowered without measure by the Spirit to show us God, to represent God, to, to redeem us, to rescue us as God. And this crowd didn't receive the Messiah's ministry. And so today we're always, our role is to always receive the Messiah's mission to us. He came to his hometown and he lives inside of us. We're his hometown now. How many of you know that? He lives inside of you. But sometimes we resist the mission of the Messiah, don't we? Sometimes we're like, Really? And we could kind of get mad when we hear the word of God. We could kind of, you ever felt a little clammy when the word of God kind of gets in your comfort space? It's trying to, Jesus is talking to us through the word. And sometimes we could become over familiar. Just like these folks were over familiar. They're like, that's just Joseph's son. That, that guy grew up over there three blocks away and now he's acting like he's all that. And sometimes we can do that like, I'm a member at First Pres. I've been baptized. I don't need to listen to what I think might be the Holy Spirit telling me to do this and telling me to do that. And we kind of resist the mission of the Mashiach, the Messiah in our life. We are saved, but we're also being saved. How many of you know that? Amen. Veronica prays for me all the time. Save that guy. Let him... Let him... Let him be... Let him talk saved. Let him think saved. So we're being saved. We are saved. And when Jesus begins something, he, you know, he's a carpenter in every renovation project, which I'm the chief renovation project. Whatever he starts, he finishes. How many of you know that's good news? If Jesus is swinging his hammer and, and creating in you his own image, and, and, and as Romans 8 verse 33 says, he's conforming you into his own image. If he started, once he starts, he's not like us. He doesn't take breaks. He doesn't go on vacation. He doesn't retire. He who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. And so let's look at the passage. This is Isaiah that Jesus reads, and he's reading the mission statement of the Messiah. Every company, or at least a lot of companies, have a mission statement. God foretold the mission statement of his Messiah hundreds and hundreds of years before he came. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In other words, this is why I'm anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Certainly, it seems like people who are poor are more open to the gospel. But I think he's, he's going deeper here. And Jesus salutes this in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon of the Mount. Blessed are the poor. I don't know about you. I know poor people that will stab you in the back. So being poor doesn't recommend you to God. I know rich people will stab you in the back twice. Let's be fair. <laughs> but what does that mean? It means people who know I have no power. I'm impoverished spiritually. I have nothing to recommend. There's no way I could buy heaven. There's no way I could, I could buy God's touch on my mind, my heart, his blessing, his presence, his favor on my family, in my future. I'm broke. And Jesus says, when, you're, when you know you, that's your condition, you're blessed. You're about ready to become enriched by grace, by salvation, by God's presence. But that's the first step, like in a recovery program. In recovery, they got you first you got to get up. Hey, hello, my name is so-and-so, and I go to the taco truck too much, and I'm a fat boy, but I'm here now to recover from the taco truck, or whatever it might be. You got to first admit where you're at. So keep praying for me. I get the moment of clarity at some point. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. Remember Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick. 
little secret, we're all sick. <laughs> he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, overcome with grief and despair. Sometimes bravado and anger is the biggest cover and cloak for a broken heart. My heart is broken. It doesn't function. I can't achieve a vision or a dream. So instead, I put on garb and I join a gang or, or I become a macho or I do something. I become an entrepreneur because I'm broken inside. And so I'm trying to put something together to define myself because I have nowhere with all or resources to really thrive. And sometimes uh, we have all kinds of substitutes that are covering up our broken hearts. We're trying to become successful. We're trying to get beautiful people. We're trying to achieve certain dreams because we think if I could achieve this, my life will be whole. But if we're not brokenhearted, then we don't do all those things to somehow become somebody because we realize I am somebody. But human beings have broken hearts. And Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. It's a beautiful thing when you come to faith and you sense my heart is at home. Ever since then, I'm at home. In God's presence. I'm at home. I was once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm at home. My heart is being mended. I know who I am. I don't have to try to be this. I don't have to try to identify with this political party or that political party. I don't have to be so identified with my race or my culture. I found out who I am. I'm God's child. And your heart it's put back together, the center, the deep essence of who you are. You're like, man, I'm God's child. That's who I am. Verse 18, and the recovery, oh, uh, it's all verse 18, but see, to proclaim the liberty, liberty to the captives. Freedom, no longer bound and enslaved by religion that says you have to do this and learn all these dogmas and do that to climb your way to God. But, but Jesus says, I'm here to free you. You can't live a perfect life, so I'm going to live a perfect life for you. You can't and don't want to pay for your sins, so I'm going to be punished for you. You're dead to God, but I'm going to come alive. And if you want, my resurrected reality will resurrect your heart and bring you from spiritual death to life so that you start to want God, so that you start to get God, so that you start having a hunger for God. So he sets captives free, people who are enslaved to spiritual death, sin, the penalty of sin, the law. He sets us free. How many of you know you're free? You're free from punishment. There's no punishment hanging over your head if you're in Christ. You're free from the penalty of breaking God's law. How many of you know you're free in Christ and God loves you? You're alive to him forever and that's it. Even if you never come to this church again, you're free in Christ. But I think if you're free in Christ, you're going to keep coming. <laughs> free in Christ. That's awesome. Free at last, free at last, free in Christ. And recovery of sight to the blind. No longer in darkness. All this world is in darkness, isn't it? All the new ethics and all the stuff you hear about what's supposed to be right now. It's just they've turned it upside down. What's wrong, what used to be wrong is now called right. And what used to be right it's called wrong. <laughs> We're in darkness. People don't know how to be married no more. People don't know how to raise kids anymore. People don't know how to be human beings or human beings anymore. I know that seems kind of dramatic for you because all the people you hang out with love Jesus and are nice. But you don't have to travel that far or hang out with too many different people outside of your circle group. You'll realize that. People are in the dark, worshiping money, worshiping power, 
worshiping substances, worship, uh, objectifying other human beings or bodies, tripping out on the color and pigmentation of other people's skins, their political background. This world is in darkness. And Jesus said, I came to give you a headlamp, to give you light so that you could see that God is the most valuable thing there is and that you to love your neighbor as yourself. He came to give light to those who sit in darkness, to give sight to the blind, who, who, who are blind to who God is and what his purpose for their life is. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. That word oppressed means exploited and systematically harmed by others. So many children to fit that description. Exploited and systematically harmed by others. So many people groups that would fit in that description. Exploited, systematically harmed by others. Even people who look empowered and well-to-do on the outside. Sometimes I wonder if even they are, are, are systematically the result of social engineering and the redefinition of what society is and different things. And so... Jesus, I come to set the oppressed free. People that are systematically being brainwashed. People who are systematically being turned into cogs and pawns so that a few top dogs could rule and reign at the top. I came to set you free and to introduce you to your true king, your true Lord, your God. And so he sets us free and says, no, you don't need to serve Caesar no more. You don't need to serve that plant, that substance anymore. You don't need to serve the whims of your sinful nature anymore. I'm bringing you to God. And you're no longer going to be oppressed and dominated and systematically at the whims of your sinful nature or some kind of social engineering or the prince of darkness and the spirit of the air who works in the children of disobedience. I'm setting you free from all that. And verse 19, I love this. I wish I would have heard this when I was age 21 and I was so in debt up to my eyeballs. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, per Isaiah, Messiah is here and I'm here to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In Hebrew, it's the jubilee. That, that's what they were hearing, jubilee. Jubilee only comes around over so many years. I think it's every 50 years, Penny. How often do you got to wait for jubilee? 50 years. Every 50 years, they would herald and say, guess what? All of you, you, you families that lost your lands because they were repossessed and transferred to someone else, you get your land back. All your debts are released. How many of you would be excited tomorrow if you got a, if you got a, a letter from the car dealership and, and your mortgage company? It's paid off. Your doctor bills, paid off. So Jesus gets up and says, I'm here to proclaim jubilee. You owe God no debt. I'm here to pay all your debts to remove all your liabilities. I'm here to tell you you're a slave and indebted to no one. Jubilee. When it was Jubilee, they would shout, they'd have tambourines, they would have banners, they would go cray cray. How many of you know we should be going cray cray in our hearts? I am free. Free to love God, free to serve people, free not to trip but to serve people and not worry if I'm going to come out in the short end of the stick, but to know that God has set me free. Two or three little thoughts and then we'll get ready to close. God has set you free and continues to set you free. In Romans 8, Romans 6, 18, and having been set free, that's in the past tense, right? Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. What an awesome thought. You've been set free once and for all. If you're really born again, if you're really a new creation in Christ, if you're genuinely in a right relationship with God, 
you're alive, born again of imperishable seed. And now, in a certain sense, forever, your heart is after God. Yes, we can backslide. Yes, we can get dumb for a while, a couple years maybe. But at some point, that new life in you overcomes the old nature and you're back at it. I can't help myself. I want you, God. I want to obey you. You're a slave of God, no longer a slave to sin, although we continue to sin and we'll always have a sinful nature till we see God, but we're not enslaved to it. But rather, there's something in us now that always, at some point, even if it's doused, even if it's quenched, that appetite and hunger for God will come back. When everybody was cutting Jesus loose, he looked at his apostles and said, are you guys going to take off too? And they're like, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's like once you come alive to God, you're like, nothing else really matters. Sure, there's fun to be had. There's beautiful moments to be had. There's lands to be seen and ships to get on and planes to get on. But even that, the fun runs out. Only you satisfy my heart. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm going to have all the fun I can have. But I know every, every time I have a fun trip, I realize, like, all right, that was cool. But, but really, sometimes the most satisfying times are just sitting down and enjoying people or being in God's presence alone and just that. There have been times, and I'm sure you've experienced them, and you're like, I could just sit right here with the presence and the glory of God forever. Like, this is just heaven right now. Heaven visiting you right now as you're in the word and you're praying in the Holy Spirit you just fill him in your heart and you're like man why don't I do this more often why am I always going for the substitutes and the fried ice cream and the okie doke man John 8 31 36 Jesus said to the people who believed in him you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful. And then he says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. I'm going to go back to that in a little bit. But Jesus says, you're a son and you're free. God wants us to continue to seek freedom. Galatians 5.1, so Christ has truly set us free. Truly. Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again into the slavery to the law, like religion. Don't start operating out of guilt. Don't start feeling alienated or distant from your mind. Keep believing, I am free. Keep receiving the unlimited favor of God, the unlimited of grace. Don't let anybody get you back into guilt, into shame-based religion. You are free. Stay free. Don't let your mind become re-brainwashed with religion that says you have to uh, do these dogmas and do this and that. Stay free in your mind. Jesus loves me. He lived for me. He died for me. I'm his child. Heaven is my home. He's going to help me in this life. I can do all things through Christ. Stay free. That's what what the word is telling us right there. You've truly been set free. Now stay free. You are a minister of the good news, of freedom. How many know the gospel is good news? You're a minister of the good news of freedom to your family, your friends, and your co workers. The best way to be good news of freedom is to be free yourself, to psychologically enjoy the benefits, to have the spiritual power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to be like any other Joe or Josie. You're going to have times where you're down, where you're kind of grouchy and in the flesh. But, you're going to, but, but, but what's mostly going to mark your life, even though at times people are going to see you're very human, they're going to see that there's also an X factor about you, that there's also, yeah... He's, he's still kind of a little weird here, and always going to be a little weird there, but there's something real there. There's, God is in there somewhere. And the, it, deep in, when you get peeled behind the mess, and you become a witness of freedom. In Matthew 16, 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. 
of heaven. How many of you know when you have the gospel, you have keys in your pocket? Somebody showed me the keys once. My mom tried to show me the keys, but I don't know, like a prophet's not received in their hometown. Someone had to tell me, I'm not shoving needles in my arm no more. Here. I'm not going to prison, jail anymore. All my friends, we're all, all taking turns dropping each other off at the ER, overdosing. Someone gave me the keys. You're in a pit. You're lost. But, and you're living like the heaven shut over your life, like there's no hope. Like you have no way to, to achieve a vision. But here's some keys. The good news. And you have the keys. And he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Today, I'm loosing, setting free when I'm saying, you're free from religion. And if you believe that in heaven, they'll make good on that promise because it's a gospel promise that we're free. He who, 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 he who the sun sets free is free indeed. So I'm proclaiming that. Here on the earth, I'm loosing you with the gospel. I'm showing you the keys. If you grab the keys, heaven says, the engine will turn on. If you turn the key, so to speak, heaven, whatever you loose on earth, if they get in the car and turn on the thing, it'll be loosed in heaven. The Holy Spirit will come and make effective, efficacious, all the gospel promises. So whatever you loose, my, my, I've told you many stories. That's what my mom would do. Even though uh, I was in darkness, and it was still like two years before I got saved, Pastor Ron, Pastor Ron, she would call me Pastor Ron. I wasn't even a Christian. Pastor Ron. She was loosing me. And finally, when I received it, heaven loosed me and made me a new creation. So you have the keys. You've got to loose people. Even other Christians, sometimes you've got to loose them. Oh, God loves you. Stop believing that. God loves you. He's going to meet your needs. Stop. Come on. Stop having a pity party. Or forgive that other brother. Come on. You're loose. You're set free. Knock the head off. <laughs> Come on. Get over it. You have the, you have the gospel promises. You, you were to loose people. And if people receive it in their heart, heaven says, yes, I'll fulfill my gospel promises. I will set people free. One last passage. Let's see, what time is it? Okay. Zechariah 9, 9, 11, 12. We usually only talk about this on Palm Sunday, this passage. And usually we just read it out of the New Testament, but it's really Zechariah 9, 9, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus even lived. How many of you remember Palm Sunday? Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. The king is here, Messiah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we usually stop there. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant. How many of you know you have a blood covenant? That's what we do with communion, right? This is the blood of the new covenant. Because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners. It's Isaiah 66, but from Zechariah. I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. That's a deep graphic, isn't it? I remember feeling like that. Man, I'm trying to climb out of the Sanger, trying to climb out of being broke, trying to climb out of mental health issues, trying to climb out of addiction. Sometimes we're still climbing out of things and we need to grab God. I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress. You prisoners of hope. 
How many of you know we have hope? In a certain sense, we're still kind of prisoners because we live in a world that we're like salmon swimming upstream and we still have a sinful nature until we see Jesus face to face. But we have hope. He said, return to your fortress, your hiding place, your sure place of victory, God. It reminds me of Psalm 91. Is that the right Psalm? I will dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my fortress. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Receive the mission of the Messiah. Receive the keys. Stay free yourself and don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Hold those keys out to your family. Believe for your adult children. Believe for your co-workers. Believe for your besties. He says, I will sit your, set your prisoners free. Now, I know it's a mystery. Not everyone's going to come to faith. But everyone that I love and know, in my mind, you're going to heaven. You're going to get saved. You don't even know you're going to get saved. And if that doesn't happen, well, then that's when I'll hear. Like, oh, I said, where's so-and-so? Oh, they're not here. <laughs> Never made a reservation. But that's the way I believe. The Bible says, believe in the Lord, you and your house will be saved. We know that's not an absolute promise. But when you hold those keys out, a lot of people come. I remember praying for years and years and years, me and my mom. My mom prayed me out, showed me keys. And then we had a lot of relatives that just didn't know Jesus. And, we, and then finally, after like seven years, Wow, it just hit me. Seven is completion, right? We were praying, praying, praying. My grandfather got saved on his deathbed. He was like the head pin. And then um, my grandma and my dad came to faith. Then six of my aunts came to faith. All in one year. Five of my uncles got saved. About 28 of my cousins got saved. We filled four rows of people in our hometown church in Santa Barbara. They used to uh, uh, persecute my mom, make fun of my mom a lot, so did I. <laughs> you drank the Kool-Aid, you're brainwashed. And she had four rows of people sitting there. And then their adult friends started coming in. And then homies started coming to church. I mean, it's just contagious. If somebody will get the keys and not be embarrassed of the keys, there's freedom. And so, bring out the keys. Receive the mission of the Messiah. I've come to set people free. I've come to say the debts are canceled. We got to get the keys, church. The, the keys to church, having a good church is not just... Um, well, part of it is being nice and a budget and a nice campus. The keys is the gospel. We gotta, the keys, not religion. So receive the Messiah, receive his mission. And let's not be like the, the home crowd. Jesus later on tells them, the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And they, say, they told him, we're the children of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to nobody, even though yeah, Egypt, Babylon, Rome. Like, we've never been enslaved to anyone. We know who our dad is, Abraham. We don't know who your papa is. They were innuending that Jesus was illegitimate. And so that's what made that crowd mad, because he said, being a descendant of Abraham is going to get you nowhere. You have to realize you're blind, naked, enslaved, broken, and I'm here to set you free. And they got so angry that they're going to throw them off a cliff. Now, before we're harsh on them, sometimes we do that. I sensed a little resistance when I was holding up the keys. We get mad when we hear about the mission of Jesus, don't we? Like, we know where you live. You live at Tim Palm Court. <laughs> we know half the time you forget your schedule. So, so we have to, when we hear the mission of Jesus, 
You got to receive it. Got to. Re that's right. I'm going to own those keys. I have the keys. I'm going to receive it. Don't be like them. Like we're already. Come on, man. We're 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 First Presbyterian. Been here 144 years. We ain't going nowhere. We've got to be careful. We always have to st stay free and remember why we're here. Our message. Okay, I've said enough. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for this message. Bless us and fill us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you because of what Jesus did. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that guides us, teaches us, and at least for me, puts me in check every day. I thank you for that. Lord, thank you for the gifts that have been presented today. It's um, hard to not notice the deficit, but Lord, there is none with you. And you can fix that. And Lord, this church means so much to the community. And everything we do counts for eternity in the lives of someone. Help us to remember who we belong to in every word that we say and everything we do. Bless us as we go forward. Bless the gifts and offerings that have come to provide keys to someone who needs to know about your son. We love you. We praise you. And we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.
blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Now go from here in the love of God. Go here, there in the grace of our Lord Jesus and go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit knowing that you hold the keys and you are in the favor of God. God bless you. Jesus Thank you for seeing.